This is a Dude Studios production. And hey, I'm the dude. Hey guys, this is Tanya Fritch, and you're listening to Hey Bartender Podcast. Hey bartender, have me a drink. The reason that I'm here, because I need time to think. All the way. Welcome back to Hey Bartender Podcast, everybody. I am the bartender for the evening. I am the dude. So that's what you call me, or you can call me Anthony. We've pretty much already been over that. Today, I have the honor of having a very special guest on Hey Bartender Podcast. Her name is Tanya Fritch. She is a longtime bartender, server, and the author of Just the Tip, the ins and outs of the industry. It's available on Amazon right now. She tells all of her stories about her life in the service industry and how she got there. And it's a great book, it's a great read, but I'll leave it to her to tell you a little bit about it because we're going to talk all about it here in the next few minutes. But at first, of course, we've always got to start with the drink special. So I got Tanya to tell us a little bit about of a drink special that she has. Let's have a listen. So I would do an old fashioned drink special. Um, that would be a really good special because they're usually a pricier drink. <laughs> but um, what I would do is you could either take a, a sugar cube, which I really like, and I'll put a little simple syrup in it, I'll muddle it for a minute, Add an, uh, I like the big ice cubes, you know, the big round ones or the huge square ones. One ice cube, I would probably do uh, not freak for my choice of bourbon. And then I would peel an orange, um, the, what is it, the skin, and twist it over it so that you get the zest. And then I swirl it around the rim so I could taste that zesty orange when I'm sipping on the bourbon. And I was, as I was telling you earlier, I like cherries. I know some people are against cherries and old fashioned, but I really like a um, marinated cherry in it because it gives it some sweetness. And there you go. That's this week's drink special. Hey, sorry guys, I'm sounding a little bit funny, but I am on the road right now. I am on vacation and I just had to finish up this podcast and don't have my usual equi- equipment with me. But bear with me because the interview I did with Tanya is everything that you expect it to be. Everything Hey Bartender Podcast is always offered for you guys. So with that, let's uh, remind you guys first, if you want to be a part of Hey Bartender Podcast, just follow me on Instagram or Facebook, both are Hey Bartender Podcast, or even TikTok, it's uh, at Hey Bartender Podcast. If you, want to, if you have a drink to share with me, if you have a story to share with me, you want to be on the show, or you have a band that wants to be on the show, all you have to do is drop me a message on any of the social medias, or even send me an email. That's dude at heybartenderpodcast.com. Now, let's get to the interview with Tanya Fritch and her talk about her book, Just the Tip, The Ins and Outs of the Industry. So, yeah, let's get this started. Tanya, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being on Hey Bartender Podcast. Uh, uh, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Now, first of all, I want you to introduce yourself to everybody, please. Yeah. So, my name is Tanya Fritch, and I wrote a book um, called Just the Tip, and it's all about um, my experience in the industry, starting off with like hostessing, waitressing, and then moving into bartending. Okay, uh, and I've uh, I'm going to be honest here. I've read the sample on uh, on Amazon because that's all was available to me at uh, at the right time. I haven't been able to get my copy; hasn't shown up in my mailbox yet. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm waiting to uh, to read the rest of it. Uh, it's excellent. Excellent start, uh, and I really want to get into uh, get into some of uh, your later stories because your the intro to that uh, into your book is incredible in itself, and it really drew me in. Okay. So uh, about yourself now, um, let's just dive in here. Um, I'm going to go in and out on some of the stuff that you wrote in your book, and uh, we'll just kind of mess around until it gets stupid. <laughs> yeah. But, um so usually i ask people when they started in the service industry you know well when was your first job when was uh what entailed you getting into your first work but since i read your book you went even farther back and that i found fascinating you actually spent time 
waiting waiting around hanging out in wherever your mother worked in this uh, when she worked in a restaurant. Uh, can you tell me about that experience a little bit? Yeah. So when I was younger, honestly, I don't even remember how old I was at the time. I was pretty young uh, to start, but my mom kind of uh, waitress and bartend all throughout pretty much until I think I was in middle school, maybe. Um, but basically, you know, my dad had three kids at home because it was me and my two brothers and we were little. So he would have to go. Um, we went and picked her up. She didn't like driving at night. So he had to load like all three kids in the car go get my mom at like two in the morning. And I know sometimes, I mean, we would love it though. We would like try to stay up as long as possible to make sure, you know, we weren't being left behind. And um, sometimes my grandma would come over and watch us and we'd be like, no, we want to go, you know, like and he would take one of us. And it was usually me because I was the night owl. And I would literally like try to stay awake just so he would pick me. And we would just go watch my mom work. And it was just such a fun environment. You know, she probably worked at a, corporate chain bar at the time but it was like music was all around and you know just her running around trying to get cut real quick um you know do her side work and then all the while giving me like free shirley temples and brownies and i think that's why i was really going it's such a snack (laughs) definitely i'm sure (laughs) but i remember just thinking everybody was laughing and it was such a grown-up atmosphere especially for me being a kid you know not allowed normally in that atmosphere I was just like, wow, this is so cool. She gets to have fun every day at her job. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this, you know, in my book, I'm like, now I know it's a complete cover up for insanity. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we all go through that sort of thing. Some of us go into restaurants when we're younger. We uh, like in high school years, we're hanging out in restaurants with our friends or even something as uh, trivial as watching Cheers on TV. And we think, oh, the bartending or uh, wait life, uh, waiting lifestyle seems like it's uh, pretty cool, laid back, and you're having fun with friends and people. And it's not until later on we find out it's all a lie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, maybe For not, sure. com- <laughs> maybe not completely a lie, but <laughs> we saw fun, but it's a lot more stressful than it. They make it look <laughs> right now. You. Uh, Go into details on how uh, you didn't want to become a server. You you wanted to avoid working in the restaurant industry completely at one time. Now, uh, remi- uh, remind me again, and please tell the listeners what was your what did you have your sights set on uh, before you uh, realized I, I need a job, I need money now. Yeah, I mean, after a while, you know, I was I think I was sixteen, seventeen, and I'm. Sure, I wanted a car, or, or I think I got my brother's hand-me-down car, and my parents were like, you just have to pay the insurance. You know, whatever it was, something provoked me to get a job. Maybe I had to pay for a cell phone. My parents were always very like, you can have this if you can pay for it. So, you know, I wasn't, and it's not because they were trying to help us out. You know, they were trying to teach us responsibility. Of course. So I didn't have a cell phone until I could pay for it. I didn't have a car until I could pay for it. You know, sometimes they would let us pay them back, but we still had to pay for it. And I remember me and my I have a twin brother, we were both looking for jobs near each other because we were uh, sharing a car at that point. And so he would drop me off and then vice versa. And so he ended up getting a job at Staples across the street. And at first, yeah, I didn't want to work in a restaurant because my mom, after a while, I would start to hear her stories the older I got. And then it did sound kind of absurd to me when I would say, how much did you make? And she would tell me, and I'm like, well, do you think you were worth like more tips or better tips? You know, I didn't understand like why she wasn't making more, even though at the time that seems like a lot of money to a kid. Sure. And I was like, wait, people give you what they want to give you? You know, like, wait, what? Like, I, I think my whole vision just came crashing down where I was like, so they don't have to give me anything? <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> wait. And so I think I was more so like, I want a guaranteed pay job and not something I have to like kind of beg for money, you know? Mm. Um, but my mom was like, no, I think your first job should be at, you know, a restaurant. You should be a hostess. And I was like, Ugh. so I just remember I didn't go to any of those. I went to like gym, bank, everything else. And they were all like, no, you don't have any experience. And then of course the first corporate chain place, you know, like it, I think my first place was a Ruby Tuesdays. Um, I walk in, they're like, yeah, we'll hire you. And I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, All before, right. <laughs> before I started getting work in the uh, restaurant industry, I was running through the same problem too. I was actually kind of avoiding it and uh, was just being like, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. Uh, and trying to get a job anywhere like you, uh, just like you at one point, did you ever sit back and say, okay, you say you want experience, but how do I get experience if you're not going to hire me? Did, uh, a hundred percent. That's even in my book. I said, <laughs> how am I supposed to get experience if you won't give me any experience? <laughs> and then I said, apparently you don't need experience to walk people to a table. Right. And I said, yes, that's a real job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that used yeah. to that used to annoy me so badly and uh and somehow I sat back and thought well I've been to your retail store I've been to your uh been to your business and uh those people working there aren't rocket scientists and you're not going to give me a shot and right my go to was always a pilot never flew a plane before he flew a plane you know what I mean like there's no experience. The only experience is literally getting in a plane. I mean, when do we ever experience that? We won't, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I always said, I'm a firm believer, and I've said every job I've ever had, I told them this, and almost every job I ever got, I had no experience in that field. But I was always like, you know, I can learn. I think we could all be taught what to do, right? Like, I mean, a doctor learns how to be a doctor, a lawyer learns how, you know, we all are capable. <laughs> it's yeah. just if we want to put that energy into it right uh some of those places they were uh they just assumed that we were just it was just a fluke we were you know we just wandered in we were just looking for a job one company said ask me uh where do you see yourself in five years and that was a death trap if i said absolutely anything other than working for them it was uh that was pretty much okay uh, your resume's in the toilet sorry and I'm like, nobody knows where they're going to be in five years, at least not when you're 18, 19 years old. And uh, I've once again, I thought about that retail place, and I said, I think pretty much every time I've walked into your retail store, you've had a different employee. I've never seen the same employee twice. <laughs> yeah. My answer to the five-year question was, oh, I, I mean, at first, I'm really bad at interviews, by the way. Not so much podcast interviews, but like job interviews because I'm really not, I'm, I'm a bad liar. <laughs> so I just lying in interviews all together. Like I made it a thing where I was like, you know what? At least if they do hire me, they know they're getting the real deal because I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And it's worked out well, but I used to say, I just hope I'm happy in five years. So, you know, if that's Excellent still doing answer. this. <laughs> yeah. And you know, because that's a good answer. That's if this job makes me happy, if I feel like I've had growth here, if I feel like I could still challenge myself here, yeah, absolutely, I see myself here. If not, I'm obviously going to do something that does make me happy, makes my life happy. And so I feel like when I switch my answer to, I do, I, you know, I hope I'm happy in five years. That's where I want to be. What are you going to say to that? Like, yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> if uh, the, if the manager doesn't like that answer, they're probably not happy. <laughs> so oh. yeah, they're like, don't stay here, run. <laughs> It's a very John Lennon answer. I like that. Uh, yeah, it's so cheesy, but I can be definitely, I always say I'm a little hippy dippy. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, my first uh, actual real bartending position was a banquet bartender at a hotel. And they asked me uh, where I see, saw myself in five years. And I, by then I was thoroughly tired of that question. And cause I felt it was an un- unfair question completely. And I basically told him, well, I heard the Beatles have an opening. I'd like to do that. And that made him laugh. (laughs) That's a perfect answer. (laughs) I had one job say, yeah, if you could do anything, what would you do? And normally the answer they got was like, oh, I hope I move my way up to a senior executive here, you know? And um, my answer was not that. I think I said, like, I'd be a, I, I literally think I said I'd be a famous writer. And they were like, Thank you for answering that correctly. And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, people will say, oh, if I could do anything, I would, I would be here doing this. And, and my manager at the time was like, what? If you could be anybody or anything in the entire world, would you not choose to have LeBron James job? I mean, you would be here. <laughs> you lying? Like, <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I didn't even think about that. You know, you said if I could be anything, I didn't even think to relate it to the job, to be honest with you. Yeah, unfortunately, some people get stuck in that hole where they sit back and say, oh, 
whatever you want me to say here, or, you know, what's, you know, what's, what's the answer that's going to most likely get the job. And I think you even talk about that in your book where they, uh, your, your first interview, it's like the first two pages of your book where you said, uh, uh, that you're sitting down for the interview and they say, ask you, why do you want this job? And what was, yeah. what was your answer why? to that? Yeah. They said, why should we hire you? And I said, why? Well, I, I noticed you had a sign on your door that said we're hiring. <laughs> I mean, pretty much like, I'm here because you need me to be here. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. That's like, need a person. I'm a person. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> that that roped me in immediately. That well, because if you uh, if in a book or a TV show or something like that can make me laugh immediately, I'm pretty much hooked. So, well, you know, I always did think that question was a little absurd too. And I, I like, why should I? Why should we hire you? It's like they're tricking you, even though the whole point is I found your ad online. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's always just. I know they want you to sell yourself, but. Um, that was just always a weird question to me. And, and I like, I go into a job now, you know, I used to be bad about it, but I say like, do I want to work here? You know, like, what can I get out of this? And I think, you know, that helps you be more confident in your uh, interviewing skills and everything. Yeah. But if you actually ask that to the manager, the, that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. What do you guys have to offer me? <laughs> yeah, it really does. Um, A lot of people, yeah, I mean, they don't want you outside the box, you know, mm-hmm. especially like, a corporate setting or anything where you know I mean we've been taught hey you go to school and then you do this and then you do that and then you get the job and then you retire I have not had more issues with the box (laughs) you know my whole life I've been outside the box I don't even know how to get in the box like like I'm knocking like what's normal feel like you know (laughs) yeah um, yeah, first interview, I was just like, well, I saw that you guys were hiring. I need a job. No one, I think I even told the first manager, no one will give me experience, but they say, I don't have any, like, kind of, can you help me out here? Mm. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you, that, is that something that you would suggest to anybody that you know, they're like, I'm having the hardest time finding a job. Is that, is that some of the templates that you would give to people when they're going in for interviews? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, especially if it's like one of your first jobs. Yeah, just t- just be honest. So many people are afraid of saying the wrong thing, and my thing is, if you can go to nine places after that, somebody's going to say yes. You know, like everybody. I think. I mean, I don't know if, if everybody does this. I know I used to do this. I used to, you know, oh my god, I'm so afraid of no all the time. You know, like, and then I'm just like, it's the worst. You know, like, why do I care if ten people tell me no, twenty people tell me no? Someone's going to say yes. I'm going to keep asking until I get in it. Say yes. So I would say just go in there and be honest and say, I don't have any experience, you know, um, but I'm definitely willing to work hard. You know, just tell them what you're actually going to do instead of the answer you think they want to hear. Mm. And that's what me every time. I can't tell you. My friends joke about it because they're like, your interviewing skills are so like not professional <laughs> because so honest. You know, I go in there, I'm being bubbly and funny, kind of like, you know, my personality. And they're like, Tanya, like, be more professional, be more calm. And I'm like, but it's not me. Like, they they need to know what they're getting because it's going to show very quickly. <laughs> right. Yeah, don't uh, don't be a cookie cutter. And then all of a sudden you come, uh, you come out and no, because, yeah, that's very good just to be yourself. And uh, which I and was. people can see through it. Yeah. I was never very good during interviews being being myself until probably that day where I mentioned that I would be a rhythm rhythm guitar player for the Beatles. But uh, love it. <laughs> but I mean, I'll go into an interview. The first line I say to break the ice is, "I'm not very good at interviews, just so you know." <laughs> and they okay, this should be interesting. And it breaks the ice, though. You know, it's so nerve wracking when you're meeting each other for the first time. Right. And I was a recruiter for a while as well during the day. And I had to give interviews to people and I saw how nervous everybody came in and I would always say, Hey, don't be nervous. The worst thing I can say to you is no. And I'm not going to be mean about it, but it might not be the right fit, you know? So guess what? You're going to be the right fit for somebody else. And they would just be like, okay. And I'd be like, just talk to me like, you know, like you would. And they were like, can I tell you how comfortable you made me feel in this interview? I'm like, good. Because why are we so scared of interviews? You know, (laughs) like it's so, such a weird concept to me. Well, it sounds like that you, uh, if you were ever to 
uh, I hear actors and actresses all the time that they have to develop a thick skin for the word no because they go auditions after auditions after auditions all the time. And that even sounds like perfect advice for uh, for them. And uh, because, well, even if they, uh, well, maybe they don't need the advice because they've already been through it. But if you're, uh, I don't know, if you have a child and they decide they want to be an actor, you you, you already got the skills and uh, to teach them to don't, you know, it's not the end of the world if you hear no. Yeah, don't get down on yourself. You know, I think I think a lot of people are just afraid of rejection. And I think we take a lot of that, you know, on internally, like, oh, I feel rejected. I'm rejected. I'm a reject. And it has nothing to do with you internally, you know? And so I hope more people do that. You know, I, I think the next, I don't know, the next generation, like, I can't tell if they're going to be worse with rejection because it's more like a superficial you know, way of life we're living with all the social media and stuff, or if they'll be better with it because we are all on social media on Twitter saying like, F you, you know, whatever. So I don't know if they're going to have a thicker skin or, you know, not so much. I can't tell yet. (laughs) So, um, about your first night as a server, it sounded Mm -hmm. like uh, in your book that you, you got thrown into the fire. They thought, we'll just give you a couple tables. It'll be easy for you. But you got hell on earth your first time out <laughs> uh oh yeah and uh you you talk about it uh you talk about it well in your book but uh how did you manage to get through that i mean because because the way it sounds like cause my first day working in uh in a restaurant um as a as a waiter or a bartender whatever uh, whatever it was uh, I was able just to go with the flow. Some people would be a little questioning because I introvert by nature, which is not the greatest for a bartender. But, uh, you know, I'd just be studying people right and left. But there were a couple times where I, I'd see servers where they'd be, uh, they would last maybe the first week tops. And um, and you can almost spot that. And it's just like, oh, uh, they're they're not going to last. But you powered through uh, some really hellacious customers uh, in, that you talk about in your book. Uh, did your any of your trainers really help you out, or did they just stand back and watch you uh, suffer? My trainer was very interesting. I actually talk about him in the book. Um, he did tell me during training, like, he'll probably cry in the walk-in freezer. <laughs> <laughs> he did say that. I was just like, in my head at the time, I was like, what what is shut up guys like first of all your job's not that hard i've seen it i've been eating out you know i know what happens i know what they do (laughs) they come to the table in my mind i'm like he's being so dramatic and within like you said two tables i'm like literally hyperventilating in the walking floor like i don't think i want this job this is not for me (laughs) you know (laughs) And I even joke about it in my book, but I think the cook walked in on me to get lettuce or whatever he was getting for the salad bar. And he was just like, you know, kind of gave me that look like, is she going to make it? And I'm like, oh, he's given that look to so many people. I just know it. And then I went back out and I pulled myself together and I was like, okay, just because these people want to act in a certain way or, you know, they, they have all these issues that I'm not used to dealing with. Who cares? We're just people. Like, let me just like try to get through this and you know, I told everybody I was new. Honestly, I told everybody I was new probably for a year. I was like, oh, it's like my first day, you know, <laughs> just to make sure, you know. I always recommend that, especially if you're bartending, just say, oh, yeah, I just started. I mean, I can't tell you how many good tips I got until like a, a familiar face came in and then I couldn't say it anymore because they called me there. But, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I powered through it and my, my trainer, just a real quick funny story on him. He had been in the industry for a while. I could tell he was very unhappy, you know, just burnt out. And uh, on his last day, he told all of us he would do our side work for, I think, like 50 bucks or something, where it was a hellacious night. And he was like, hey, I'll, I'll do this for you. Took all our money. He must have walked out with like 200 bucks and quit. Didn't do any of the side work and just walked out of the building. Oh, man. <laughs> but I can't tell you, I was like, oh man, I, I was mad. But I was like, if I ever quit here, I'll pr- I, I would want to do that. Not, I wouldn't do it, but I was like, what a good way to go out. You know? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, that's it's like you walk out, you got money, and you walked out. <laughs> And not, He's probably in jail now, but I don't know. You got money from the company and you got money from everybody that you work with. <laughs> that's. Yeah. 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 I have and to admit that was clever, but still that sucks. <laughs> for sure. I always joke in my book. I'm like, he's probably in jail now, but it was a good way to go at the time. <laughs> like who knows what he's done since then, you know, his cons probably got bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> But you uh, you got through that first night. Ad- admittedly, I've never done it myself, but uh, because I was one of those guys where the people would not in a very nice way look at me and go, how long have you been a bartender? Or how long have you been a server? And then no matter what answer I give them, they're going to give me something snobby back. And it's, it's just, I could tell them I've been doing this for two years. And why aren't you a better server? Or this is my first day. Well, that explains a lot. And, yes. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, after you got, you powered through your first day uh, and you found out things, you found the, you probably found your niche about then and how you want to do things. It, it's not all cookie cutter, right? Yeah. I, I realized it didn't matter if I was super nice to you. I, it didn't matter if I was experienced. Basically, I just start real, started realizing it had nothing to do with me, but everything with what that customer had dealt with that day. You know, if someone was going to come in with an attitude, I could be the nicest person in the world, but maybe they had a really bad day. Maybe they're going through a divorce. Whatever it is, I was not going to please them, you know? Mm. Um, If they had a lot of money, no matter how good of a server I was, didn't mean they were going to leave it to me. Maybe they were, you know, had a lot of money because they didn't like to spend their money. Right. I mean, I just, I realized I couldn't read people. Like I couldn't, no one was ever going to fit a mold that I put them in. In the sense, you know, I couldn't, I didn't know what to expect because you're just dealing with so many different personality types per day. It's just, you know, I just had to, basically I had to lower my expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized I, you know, I kind of had to like mold myself to each table individually for what they needed. And I think that does take getting used to, you know, like I joke about it in my book, but you know, my, one of my first tables asked me about gluten. Funny enough, I now have a gluten allergy and I used to make fun of it. And I swear to God, I I have celiac now. And I I just, I'm like, that just is such karma. It's not even funny. <laughs> but I used to be like, they're making it up. This isn't even real. Like, whatever, just throw some stuff on the plate. And then now I feel so bad. I don't know how many people went home sick with whatever I gave them. But, um, you know, she asked me what was gluten. I didn't even know, you know, at, at that time gluten allergies and celiac we that wasn't a thing you know it wasn't like it's not like it is now where you could go find options it just was like what Mm -hmm. okay you're on a bad diet whatever and I said you know I recommended spaghetti I think like I didn't know what gluten was yeah I just recommended pasta you know (laughs) pasta. and she's like are you joking I mean literally the one thing she cannot have is pasta (laughs) <laughs> and then I went to the cook and I was like, what can she have that's gluten-free? And they're like, well, she can have this dish if she takes out five ingredients or this dish. And I was like, ay, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and I was like, I, and I recommended the salad bar because that's the only thing I could think of. Mm-hmm. It was such a boring offering, you know, <laughs> but it's just, it was, I, I said in the book, how crazy is it that this problem you had been dealing with, you know, had just become mine. And I've only known about it for five minutes. Right. You know, so you just have to anticipate people's needs and wants and bite your tongue a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately, I remember running into problems like that when people would come into the restaurant and, uh, you know, ask me about specific things. And like, I don't know the atomic structure of a hamburger. Why would I know, you know, if that's good for you or something like that? Yeah. But uh, fortunately for me, it wasn't life threatening uh, like your story is. Uh, but when people would come up to me when I'm working behind the bar and ask me if a vodka crayon is Atkins friendly, I'm like, I don't know. What the hell is Atkins? And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm not on Atkins. <laughs> but it, yeah, they expect you to know it. It's got to be tough. I've been out of the service industry for a little while and it, and the stuff that comes up with like uh, gluten allergies and stuff that some people actually expect the server to know. You know, if they're working into a, a mom and pop uh, menu and what here is gluten free because it doesn't say anything on the menu. I if it were me, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> or 
Yeah. It, and honestly, now I actually did talk about that with somebody recently, only because now I'm dealing with it. I'm like, oh, we need to fix this. More people need to know about this because, you know, now it's a problem for me, of course. <laughs> but I but I did think about it, especially now, because I do feel like I don't think a lot of people knew that what gluten allergy was back then. It was more like I don't feel good. So I must have a, a thing with it. But now, like we know, like things like celiac. Like, they could end up in the hospital. Like, it literally, your body cannot handle it. You know, I mean, they won't die probably, but the first time. But, you know, they will not feel good for at least a few days. Like, I've had some experiences where I was like, this is crazy. Like, I didn't know something could make you feel this bad. Yeah. And, you know, I, I ate gluten my whole life, and it's a new thing. And basically, I, I realized, though, a lot of people don't know about it. Like you said, we didn't know about it. And I went to one place recently and I said, are any of your sides gluten-free? And he's like, all of them. You want to know what his sides were? Macaroni and cheese, um, breaded biscuits, anything I couldn't have. With yeah. all sides, they're all gluten-free. And I'm like, oh, no one knows what gluten is. Like, no one even knows that all they have to look for is wheat. You know, like, they don't know that. They just see this word gluten and then they're looking for gluten. And it's just kind of interesting to me now that I'm dealing with it, but you're right. I mean, no one knows about it. It's very, they don't really train you on that in the rest, you know, in, in the, in this business. Yeah. But there is definitely more aware awareness about it is now I have, I've run into menus where they have an asterisk by it saying gr- gluten friendly or, uh, or whatever, but, yeah. uh, to actually expect your server to, uh, be able to protect you from, you know, food allergies, like, uh, if you're allergic to shellfish, don't eat the clams. Duh. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And servers have been really good about it lately with me too. They're like, Oh, just don't eat this, you know, and you'll be good. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So, uh, how long were you in the, were you in the service industry? I've been in the service industry since I was 18 and I'm, I always say my age, people get weird on podcasts. They're like, you want to say your age? I'm 34. <laughs> And I'm still bartending. I started bartending when I was 23, I think. Mm-hmm. And I'm still bartending. I, I work a day job too. So I work all the time, it feels like. But, you know, I write books. I just, I just, I have a lot of time, you know? <laughs> so you've written, uh, you've written other books other than this one? Uh, no, this is my first book I've actually like written all the way through and published. But I've been writing, you know, for myself mm-hmm. since I was like in high school. Um, poetry books, things like that. I've just never, you know, went to full length to publish something. So, but I've had this idea for this book since I was nineteen. Mm. So you you've got a day job, you've got a night job, and you're writing, which, uh, well, it's that's uh, something you enjoy. So that's not really work. That's a lot of stuff to do in a day, though. <laughs> How to? <did>, uh, <laughs> There are days where you're just like, forget it all. I'm binge watching uh, something on TV <laughs> for a day oh, or yeah. two. Oh, yeah. I mean, so Sundays, those are my Sundays. Like, I always like Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday for me is not having to do anything. Like, <laughs> I'll like do whatever I want to do, no time limit. I, I mean, there's some days where I wake up, you know, I wake up at 7 a.m. And I start my day job at 8 a.m. And then I go straight from my day job to my bar job. I get off my bar job at 3 a.m. You know, I'm up for like 22 hours of the 24-hour day sometimes. And I'm like, this is crazy. (laughs) But I'm doing it while I feel up to it, you know. And I'm a very, I need to keep occupied, like, mentally. Um, I don't do well with a lot of time on my hands in the sense. I just, I need that. I need that momentum. So it works for me, but then I do go through like major burnout periods, you know, where I'm like, okay, one job is fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one thing is fine. This is normal. <laughs> um, and then I'll get bored after a few months and I'll pick up like five more things to do. So, <laughs> Well, good for you. Uh, good. Yeah. So there, there was a period of time where I was doing uh, two jobs in one day, but then all of a sudden burnout just hit me like a ton of bricks and mm-hmm. I had no idea what to do, but uh, then it took my parents, uh, flicking me in the back of the head saying, quit one of your jobs. You make enough money. <laughs> and, oh, my friends have been saying that my family's been saying that forever. They're like, why do you have two jobs? You make enough on one job. And I'm like, 
yeah, but this is extra and then I could do this, you know, and I, believe it or not, I still have time to travel a good amount. I don't know how I just happen to get these jobs where they allow me to, but I like to travel a lot. So, you know, the extra money is good for when I'm traveling and yeah, um, very busy life. Like you said, there's days where I wake up and it's like a ton of bricks hit me and I'm like, I'm not doing anything today. My body is giving up. <laughs> yeah. And it's usually after you've realized you haven't had a day off since you were 24 years old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. It just hits you all of a sudden like that. <laughs> 10 years. Just yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you dealt with such, uh, stressful situations and uh, I've only been recently seeing on social media, people putting up memes like, a picture of a walk-in freezer and a place for servers to cry or something like that. And after, after a while I was sitting like, well, I never cried in the walk-in, but I do remember uh, punching the hell out of the lettuce boxes or something like that. And uh, <laughs> my boss being cool and saying, Anthony, you got to stop that. You know, cause sometimes they'd fall out or they couldn't pick it up without it falling out. But uh, through the many years that you've been doing, I mean, you've been managed to, make it, uh, make it behind the bar. Now going from server to bartender, I know there, there's a difference in customers by that point. Uh, uh, because you have this opportunity to make more money because the turnover is faster and, uh, but you're dealing with a lot more different personalities. Did, was there anything that you, uh, you learned about dealing with personalities? Because that was something that I had to deal with to actually, like I mentioned before, introvert by nature, but I had to learn, Oh, I have to actually talk to these people. So what were you, what was it like for you? Mine was kind of the opposite experience. I felt more awkward when I was waiting on tables because, you know, I felt like I had to present myself in, as a certain person or in a certain way in front of families. And, you know, there was kids around I know this sounds weird, but for uh, even a female being in the service industry, you know, there's a lot of couples, there's a lot of husband and wives. Sometimes you would have to like not make enough eye contact with the guy, but make sure they know that you were, you know, it could get weird because it was a flirting situation. And I, I've had people complain to me and I wasn't being too flirty, but you know, I've had like wives say, I don't want her as my waitress. And you know, things are just, I felt not like myself over there mm -hmm. when I was in the bar. I instantly was like, this is my scene. I mean, this is what I'm meant to do. I had no problem dealing with everybody's personalities. I'm pretty, you know, I'm, I'm just a pretty open, straightforward person. I, I can like, you know, kind of make you laugh. I'm pretty witty. And, you know, the guys loved it. The girls, they're drunk. They're having a good time. You know, I didn't, you get some bad people like in any part of the, the job, but I just felt so like, I don't ever want to go back to serving after this. This yes. is my, this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. I, I was the same way. I'm complaining about my eye contact over here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that story so much from uh, a lot of, unfortunately, female, female and waitresses. Uh, I haven't heard it so much from male waiters, but they get the, the woman at the table or the woman at the bar with their boyfriend or husband, respectively. Uh, they get mad you stop looking at my significant other or whatever. And I thought, well, that's got to be tough because you got to take the person's order. But my friend Shannon, she was always like, oh, I give all the attention to the girl and, and um, make friends with her first. And then uh, then it's okay to talk to her husband or boyfriend, whatever. Is that your? A hundred percent. That's what I did too. I always made the girl feel comfortable. Like I, you know, would talk to her a little bit, see why they were out, uh, ask her about herself, her outfit, you know, so she knew I wasn't a threat. And then, you know, and then I would bring the guy into the conversation because I didn't want him to make him feel weird either. And you get really cool couples sometimes that you can just tell they do not care. You know, <laughs> they know I'm not going home with their boyfriend tonight. <laughs> I'm at my job. You know, like, <laughs> I have, you know, at the time, I always thought behind the bar, like, you don't know my life. Like, what if I have a boyfriend? What if I'm with somebody? Like, why do you assume I want your person? <laughs> like, I'm just here because I'm getting paid, okay? <laughs> but, you know, and you, that's with everybody, you know. It's, yeah, some, I do remember one time a wife called my manager over 
and was offended by my shirt. It was too low or something. My manager asked me if I could go put on a t-shirt. And I said, no, absolutely not. We don't, we're not required to wear these t-shirts. She brought me like an oversized t-shirt. And I was like, I'm sorry if that lady has a problem with the way I look. I don't think she should be here. I mean, I wasn't trying to be a jerk to her, but we were all wearing the same thing. We just had different body types, you know? And I just felt so offended in that moment that, you know, I couldn't help the way my body is, you know, and that, that you would make me, it just embarrassed me that I would have to look different than everybody else. And I just remember after that, I was like, no, that was in a serving role. I was like, after that, I, you know, obviously you can wear whatever you want behind the bar. Um, People know that when they go to bars, but it was just a very awkward situation where I was like, wow, I never thought I, you know, a a lady would call me out like that because I just thought we were kind of on the same team. (laughs) (laughs) But it was just, it was an older couple and it was just really awkward. Like, I don't even think we were in the same age group for that to be appropriate for me to be flirting with her husband, but Mm. I don't know what was going on there, but. She might have just been having a bad day. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but I, after that, I was like, I'm not going back over there. I'm staying behind the bar. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's uh, focus on something positive. Did you have uh, a great uh, – you, what's your favorite moment working, whether it's behind the bar or waiting waiting tables or host uh, hosting, doesn't matter. Did you uh, – is there a story that sits in your head that makes you laugh or makes you happy every time you think about it or tell it to people? I mean, bartending in general makes me really happy. I, and that's why I'm still doing it. I, it's not just for the money anymore. You know, at one time that was my only job, but I really miss it. I've taken breaks from bartending like a few months at a time. And every time I go to a bar, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm paying so much attention to what the bartenders are doing, who they're friends with behind the bar, what drinks they're making. I just love the fast pace atmosphere you know I love the high vo- I've always done high volume bars so it's very fast it's 300 people at a time everybody screaming drink orders at you but I love that kind of chaos really slow pace like I told you my whole life's very fast paced so that just worked perfect for me and I can't think of anything in particular but I just have worked in a really fun bar where you know the energy the music the crowd it was just a good time and I just was like, this is so cool. This is my job. I get to be a part of the party, but I don't have to be hung over tomorrow. You know? <laughs> now, uh, what's your favorite atmosphere in a bar? I would say that like the high volume, you know, at part, just the go, 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 go. Everybody putting money. I mean, you know, in your face, like I've had people touch their, my nose with their money and just you know, like, <laughs> trying to get my attention. Um, but that and just, I guess becoming really skilled at it. Like I, I do enjoy a challenge and, you know, obviously when I first started, it was a disaster. I'm sure. I mean, I didn't know what they were asking for. I couldn't remember drink orders, you know, so many things to do. And there's so many shots out there, you know, oh, there's God, thousands. Yes. <laughs> and people would order the weirdest ones, you know, that you never heard of. Like, you know, do you know how to make like an alligator Kool-Aid? Like stuff you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> But I started learning colors of shots. And honestly, I just made that color. Yeah. So you had liquor. But it's probably not what you ordered. It was just the right color. So you never said anything <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, for new bartenders, that's a go-to. If you know, you know, it's supposed to be red, make it red. I promise you, they will not know a difference. They really won't. They don't know the difference between a royal flush and a sweetest fish. You know, they just don't. Mm. Um and they've been drinking they're just like whatever I just want to get drunk. um so that and I really like um I like live music so I got the chance to work in a bar with live music so that was cool I got to see it like a concert every night um and you just make really good friends in the bartending industry you oh, know you guys sure. are working long hours with each other you work vampire hours with each other so you're the only ones up to hang out with after your shift mm-hmm. <laughs> And so I just really enjoyed the, you know, the, like the companionship with it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'd never, uh, really thought about it until, uh, recently it was, uh, I'm not a big sports fan. I actually ignore sports quite a bit until the playoffs or if I have money writing on the game, 
But uh, all these sports bars, I go in and there's, you know, 57 TVs on one side of the restaurant and all playing sports. And I'm like, this is a bit much for me. But, uh, you know, if I go into like a dark hole in the wall and you hear classic rock playing off the, uh, on the jukebox, I'm automatically, ah, that that's more like it. <laughs> Is uh, gotcha. uh now is that what uh, uh, what do you picture your uh, your bar or pretty much? My bar would be so like say if I own my own bar, my bar would probably be a little bit more chill than I'm used to working in. If I like when I go to a bar, so I used to go to a bar after I got off my bar job, and it was kind of the way you described. It was kind of a hole in the wall, not so um, it wasn't like grimy. You know, how, like there's like kind of punkish rocket like you said bars we did have some of those but this was more like it was almost like a dark version of like tears but smaller mm -hmm. you know the old wood you could tell it's been around forever there's not like really a lot going on it was almost as big as a hallway you know but it was where all the bartenders would go hang out because it was quiet there was some weird song playing on the radio but you know you could really just sit there with a the beer i remember that being my favorite part I would go by myself and just like you said, just <sighs> it's quiet, but it's nice. You know, there's candles. It was, a, it was a nice glow. It was very dark. Like you said though. And I think to your point, especially me getting off a shift that was crazy with lights and bands. And mm -hmm. I think I just uh, come back down. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, uh, I, now that you've mentioned that, I think that's where my mind was going. The reason why I like those bars is because usually that's, uh, the dark, Bars are a good place to, uh, uh, what, what's the word I want? Um, just sit and back. I, I want to keep saying detox, but it's not detox, I uh, don't think, is it? It's close to what I wanted. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I lost it anyway, but it's just a place where I can just finally relax. Uh, and, but working at, uh, uh, there, there are times in the night where, uh, places that have like live music, uh, like that chain, uh, that chain restaurant or a bar that has dueling, dueling pianos up on a stage. That is hella fun, but, uh, it's, uh, there comes a point in the night or something like that where you're just like, okay, time to just, uh, sit back and relax. And, uh, but, uh, I, I remember uh, when I went to that, uh, when I went to that bar, I was like, God, I would love working here. Uh, Cause just high volume, uh, chucking drinks and, uh, the performers up on the dueling piano stage were just goofballs and, uh, I mean, being impressed with their musical abilities playing basically anything anybody asked. And I was a huge admirer of the place. Um, but I like high volume also. And, it, I don't know if it's because uh, you make more, for me, if, if it's because I made more money or I had to talk to less people. <laughs> I honestly don't know. Yeah, I think both. I think you're exactly right. I, you just do the point, you know, you just point and they tell you what they want. Um, yeah, I think so. And I think the shifts go by quicker. You know, you work long shifts. Sometimes they're 10 hours. I rather look at the clock and see it's one fifty when I get off at two, then look at the clock and it's nine and I'm like, Oh God. <laughs> How many more of you bored? You know, like it's just like a long shift. <laughs> decompress was the word I was trying I was looking for. Decompress. Yes, that's the <laughs> one I knew it was a D word. I did. <laughs> That'll be an interesting part in the podcast. Just all of a sudden, random word. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just saying a bunch of D words. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so you're still at it and you're uh, and you found time to uh, write a book about your experiences. Now, um, how did all of these stories start compiling? Did, uh, did you just uh, was it stuff over years that you just collect stories that you collected over the years or did you just sit down at a computer and just go to town? Um, it was stories I collected. So when I was. I think I was like 19 or 20. I was just working a day shift somewhere. I was still serving at the time. And I love to write. And I always said I wanted to write a book. And then literally in my mind, I said, well, what are you going to write about? You don't know anything. I mean, <laughs> not like you're not, 
you know, you, you don't have a specific thing that you're very knowledgeable about. And I said, oh my gosh, it just clicked. I was like, you can write about this. This is the one thing you're super knowledgeable about is serving and working in the industry because you've been doing it since high school. So I started writing out my stories and they always say, write what you know. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's a big writer thing. If you can write what you know, you'll write a book, you know, you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I started writing my stories down in a notebook. I still have my notebook. They're all handwritten. And it wasn't until I was a few years later, I put it on the computer and I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't know how to publish it. I didn't know how to go about that at all. And honestly, during COVID was when I sat down and I said, you've always wanted to put this book together, but you keep coming up with excuses. You're so busy. You're so this. Are you going to do it or not? You know, you keep saying you don't know how. Find out how. So I had a lot of time during COVID to do this. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) And I started researching how people publish books, how you could go the self-publisher route if no one picked up your book, how to find an editor, how to find a cover designer. And I literally went through all the steps and I said, before COVID is over, I want to release this. And I released it right. Obviously, we're still going through COVID, but, you know, through um, the lockdown. Mm. And right when we're coming out of lockdown is, I think, like a month later, I had it ready to go release. And it was super exciting. So just to see my notebook now and then to see, you know, my regular book, I'm like, wow. It's still weird. I I have people come into my bar asking me to sign it. And it's so cool because it's like my book. (laughs) Really? You got, uh, you have fans come in and ask you for autographs and stuff? Oh yeah. I've had like three bars ask me if I want to do a book signing and I haven't (laughs) done it yet because I've never done a book signing. And you know, at first I'm thinking it's nerve wracking. I'm like, is anybody going to show up? Is this going to be weird? And then I decided I don't care if anybody shows up because we're at a bar. And I could still have a good time. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm surprised that I asked a lot of people, I said, if I had a book signing, would you show up? And a lot of people said, yeah. So I think it's because um, the city I live in too is very, the bartending scene is very close knit and everybody knows everybody. So when you know someone wrote a book, you're like, I want to get my picture and the signature because I know you. And you know, if if you do more stuff, I want to say, Hey, I was in that time with you. So it's, Raleigh, North Carolina, which is where I am, oh. is so supportive. If you have anybody in the city, it is, it's like local fans, you know, fan base for everybody. We, we encourage everybody to do whatever you want to do. It's, it's a city, but it's so close. It's crazy. Uh, that's, uh, I didn't know where you were. Uh, honestly, I, yeah, honestly, I didn't know where you were from. The uh, place I was talking about earlier with the dueling pianos is in uh, Howl at the Moon in Charlotte. Um, yeah, I know exactly where that is. We actually have one. Um, it's not called that, but a dueling piano bar in Raleigh now as well. Uh, I was, uh, what what do they call that place? It's basically one giant, like, mall of um, restaurants and bars. I think it's the Epic Center. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, I work for, uh, energy company. I, uh, my day job right now is working on wind energy. And before we went out there, everybody was telling us, you got to go to hell at the moon. And I was, eh, okay, yeah, whatever. And we went there. Uh, we had a blast, but I was also fascinated. You got this ginormous building with all sorts of bars. You got your cowboy boy bar over here. You got your rock and roll bar over here. And, you know, it, it was just cool. <laughs> so much fun. They actually have a bartender's ball there every year. Well, not during COVID. But it's where all the bartenders go from Charlotte, Raleigh, any of the surrounding areas. And it's basically you buy a ticket and you drink. You go to (laughs) every stand is a drink. It's like a Jameson stand, a vodka stand. And you pretty much get dressed up and everybody gets really drunk and dances. And you're all bartending somewhere. And they call it like the bartending ball. Mm. Um, One year and we all got really drunk. (laughs) (laughs) The next day was hard to drive home, but it was really fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, yeah. North Carolina, the uh, okay. That's I've talked to a number of people from North Carolina, and it's it. My picture of the place, because like I said, I only know Charlotte, but my picture of the state is getting bigger and bigger as I gradually meet people from North Carolina, and to me, that's really cool. Yeah. 
it's a really cool city um, where I live, you know, in Raleigh, but all of North Carolina is awesome. I've, I've been to almost every single state and I love a lot of different states, but I always do come back like to North Carolina and I'm, you know, I really enjoy being here. I like living here. And I'm always like, this is a good home base for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm not from here. I'm actually from Illinois originally. Um, and I've lived in Virginia through high school and now I'm here since I was 21. And yeah, I'm still here. So we'll see. My parents want me to move to Florida, but I haven't committed yet. <laughs> um, uh, Illinois, Virginia, North Carolina. I'm surprised you, it's not like a melting pot of dialects that you've got going. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah. What would you say my accent is? Is it more Southern or more uh, Midwestern? I'd say Midwestern personally, uh, but, uh, but I, I live in tech. So too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I'm just surprised because I've been here so long now, you know? Yeah. As well, uh, I live in Texas, so everybody automatically, when I mention that I'm, uh, I live in Texas, they automatically expect me to have a Southern uh, dialect of some kind. But I've only lived here for 10 years. I'm actually from Oregon. And mm. uh, I only moved out here to work. That, <laughs> that was just the thing. But yeah. uh, every once in a while, yes, when I'm around somebody who does have a very strong dialect i tend to emulate them just a little bit and it takes me one or two days to shake it but that happens to all of us so <laughs> so oh yeah. oh yeah i've definitely said y'all on occasion and when i say it i can't help but say it with that draw you know like you can't just say y'all like i don't know <laughs> you have <to> y'all <laughs> i actually talk about that in my book when i first moved to north carolina I was like, oh, people really say y'all like that. Like, this isn't in the movie. This is real. <laughs> and it, I would say you guys, because that's how I was raised. And we always said you guys. And I actually say this in my book, too. That my One of my first tables in North Carolina was a group of women. And I said, hey, you guys. You know, and they said, there's no guys at this table. And I was so thrown <laughs> off. Them, and I was like, what, what should, oh, oh, okay, ladies. You know, what can I get you to <laughs> And I, and I never even realized that was just such a saying we said. And I I probably do say y'all now. I don't know. I don't know how often to think about what I say now. But well, even when I before I moved out here to Texas, I when I get a group of people at the bar or at a table, something, how y'all doing? It was it's yeah, it just came out quick. I don't know what the deal was with me. Yeah, it, it's an easy word for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there at my current job uh, more recently. Uh, ma the new manager came in and he starts talking to me and I'm talking back and after a while he goes, I can't place your accent. Where are you from? And I said, what accent? It, cause, uh, I'm Very like, true. <laughs> and because to me, you guys talk funny. I don't know about <laughs> what you guys are doing. Yeah, you have an accent. <laughs> People ask me all the time. They're like, where are you from? You're not from here. And I'm like, where do you think I'm from? <laughs> I always say either up north or I've gotten a few California. Really? So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it's because I say like a lot and I'm trying to be better about it. <laughs> and then I also say, I used to say dude a lot. Everybody was dude. And I don't know where I picked that up from, but. <laughs> now, there, now there's nothing wrong with dude. That's been my nickname since I was in high school. So. <laughs> See, perfect. <laughs> I, think I didn't know anybody's name. I'd say, hey, dude, you know, or dude, can you give me that girls or guys? And I remember, uh, I've even called some boyfriends, dude, and they were like, hey, don't ever do that again. <laughs> like, I'm not your dude, okay? <laughs> like, fair enough. I can I can end it here. <laughs> yeah, anybody I'd tell, uh, uh, I've you've started off a number of these podcasts saying, you can call me dude or you can call me Anthony, whatever. And there's the only one, there, I can only think of one time where I uh, was out with uh, out with a girl and I, I mentioned that my nickname to a lot of my friends was dude and she just looked at me with a blank face saying I can't do that it's not going to happen <laughs> <laughs> I can see that for sure but uh yeah using dude man I didn't have anything androgynous or, or not oh, that's the wrong word I didn't have anything generic to say uh to women but uh when a group of guys or a guy walks up to the bars hey what's up man or dude or something like that uh, I found out recently that dumbass is uh, uh, gender neutral, and yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. 
I feel like there's a few words like that. Some I won't mention, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but anyway, so uh, you back to, uh, back for a few minutes to your book. You actually, thanks to COVID, you actually were able to put in the time you want to take all this information that, or all these stories that you've accumulated over the years and put them into a book. And you were, how difficult did you find it to uh, publish, self-publish? Honestly, not that difficult, only because I reached out to people through social media. I, you know, they weren't my personal mentors, but they did help mentor me through the process. And I just realized the more people I asked, the more information I was getting. And so without knowing it, I had a lot of strangers really walk me through step by step how to get this published. When it came down to getting it published, I was so surprised I hadn't done it sooner. Mm. I had all this doubt and it was just so easy once I asked for help or looked for help or looked for videos that all the information was out there. And after that, I realized the information is out there for anything you want to do. And you just have to be not, you know, you just can't be lazy about looking for it. And, you know, I, I it's so cheesy, but you know how everyone's like, you can do whatever you put your mind to. I never believed that. I was like, that's not true. You know, like, <laughs> there's things I can't do. But for the most part, I actually think that is correct. I mean, you can find an answer if you really want to find that answer. Mm. And so I found it pretty easy. Not, and I'm, I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. There's a lot of back and forth with editors and with, uh, you know, fixing your cover and sizes of book bindings, things I have no idea anything about. You know, like I, it's, it's a lot of things you don't even realize that go into a book. But easy in the sense, I think if you really want to do it, you can and you can find people like myself. I, I started helping people out online a little bit now where they'll come to me and say, how'd you do it? And I said, I'll walk you through it if you want. Um, it's going to take time, but if you're willing to put in the time, I'll walk you through it. And they're like, oh, my God, thank you so much. And they're like, you really think I could publish this? And I'm like, absolutely. Mm. You can. I you can because I did it, you know? Yeah, obviously. And the title of the book is perfect for bartender stories or working in the uh, service industry. And uh, just the tip, I I thought that was automatically clever. And I, you know, uh, and for yeah okay a few dirty reasons because uh, bartenders and servers yeah we, our minds go a little blue every now and then i thought that's the perfect title so i re- i really liked that thank you yeah it's something i i don't know if you remember when that was such a big term you know it was such like a jokey term at one time where people would always be like just a tip you know it was just like you just said it over random things it, was, it didn't even make sense sometimes you oh, know yeah but it had the sexual you know um, joke side of it, like, oh, just a tip, you know, so when I was growing up in high school, and after that, when I was like, you know, in my 20s, that was just kind of like a joke people said, but especially like around high school age, I feel like 18, well, you know, out of high school, 18, 19, that was a big thing, and it stuck with me, and I was like, that is like the perfect book name for the service industry, because like you said, everything that's around the bar industry, our minds go there anyways, but then it is actually we are working for just the tip. I mean, that is, we don't even get paid usually any other way. Yeah. And I was like, this is perfect. Um, and I was looking for uh, something else to go with it. So it's just the tip. And then obviously it's the ins and outs of the industry. And I just wanted it all to be funny, but also have, you know, a different meaning. So um, I was really glad it wasn't taking. I was like, there has to be a service industry book about this. I know there is. Yeah. And there was I ran with it. So I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take it. It's yours. Well, uh, thank you so much. We're going to wrap uh, wrap up this show. Thank you so much for coming on my show. It is an honor to talk to you and talk to you about your book. Uh, would you please uh, let people know where to find you, where to find your book, uh, uh, give some information about yourself. Yeah, so it's just the tip, um, Tanya Fritch, and you can find it on Amazon by just typing in just the tip. Um, you can also find it in a link and find me on my Instagram, which is Tanya, it's T-O-N-Y-A dot Fritch, which is my last name, F-R-I-T-C-H. 
And you can go on there. You know, I post a lot about my book on there, but some of my personal life too. It also has a link that you can buy there. And that's all that is for sale on right now. But um, I hope to get it more out. I'm trying to get it on Barnes and Noble website soon. And then, you know, obviously if I can get it into Target or something like that, that'd be awesome. I'm thinking big right now, but I definitely do want to get it on um, Ingram and then Barnes and Noble. So I'm still figuring that out, but it should be on more platforms soon. Well, you've already proved that you can, uh, oh, well, like you said, you put your mind to it. You've done it. I, now I'm just going to sit back and watch you do it. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think so too. And I think, I definitely think I'll get on it. It's just a part of, you know, when and where. Yeah. Last call, people. Last call for alcohol. Remember, if you want to get something, come on up to the bar because I'm not going out there, even though I'm out and about right now. Right now, I'm in Oregon visiting my family, but I'm trying to make my way around the area, try to meet some new people, try to uh, push the podcast. It's actually kind of fun, if you ask me. The poker chips that I hand out to these people are just going like hotcakes. But remember, if you want to uh, want to be part of Hey Bartender Podcast, all you have to do is follow me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of those at HeyBartenderPodcast.com. Or if you want to be a part of Hey Bartender Podcast, email me, dude at HeyBartenderPodcast.com, and you can tell me a story that uh, about you in your bartending that night. You can uh, sh- show me the music that you'd like to be, have uh, published, or you can even just be a part of the show all if you want to be a part of the show of hey bartender podcast all you have to do is ask email me due to heybartenderpodcast.com and remember the website www.heybartenderpodcast.com you can go there pick up a t-shirt whatever swag i got going on in there remember when you buy a t-shirt or something off of hey bartender podcast uh it not only do you get a cool t-shirt it supports the show So buy a t-shirt, support my show. I would be completely grateful for that. Also, for the next month, uh, for, you know, once a month, I think I'm going to do this once a month now. Anybody who leaves a, uh, leaves a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts, I will be reading every single one of them. The best one. I will pick one out of a hat every month. And they will get a free Hey Bartender Podcast t-shirt. So head on over to Apple Podcasts right now. Leave a review. I'll put it in the hat. I'll read them on the air. And you win your chance of winning your own Hey Bartender Podcast t-shirt. Also remember people, jump on Amazon.com and pick up your copy of Just the Tip, The Ins and Outs of the Industry, written by Tanya Fritch. It is a great read, people. Uh, get out there and get yourself your copy because there is tons of stories in there. You're going to relate to every single one of them. It's great. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, I am out and about right now, but I uh, will be posting another episode this Saturday. I'm going to probably skip this uh, Wednesday just because I'm spending time with family on the West Coast, but uh, you'll want to tune in next Saturday. Trust me. Keep an eye out on the social media and who my guest is. You're going to love her. Until that next show, though, people, I just want to remind you all, lots of love, lots of sex, lots of happiness, and remember, don't take any shit from anyone. Good night. What do you mean it's last go? I just go.